Okay, um, I'm going to direct your attention to a little study that uh, a friend of mine on the Facebook put together, and I thought it was a very interesting uh, little read here. Um, uh, and um, you might know this individual when you see the name there, Valerie Villano, and uh, and she uh, brought up some very interesting points in regarding to Antichrist revealed question mark. I mean, this isn't a for sure thing, so don't go jumping off the pale pipes, kicking and screaming. You know, don't you know? That's not what this is about. Um, this is, you know, this is a study. You know, this is, you know, an idea. Um, however, the first sentence here: the identity of the Antichrist is not a man. I think that is scripturally accurate. There is no refuting it. Um, you know, as far as the position of Antichrist, I believe that it is a system, and I believe the headquarter of that system is the Vatican, okay, um, or Rome. You know, when you look at the, you know, when you look at the, the statue of the Dream of Nebuchadnezzar, you you know, you see the the head of gold, uh, the chest and arms of silver, uh, the belly and thighs of bronze, and the two legs of iron, which is Rome. And you see the iron transferred into the feet, which is iron and clay. So obviously Rome is still active in the very end of time, you know, in a very interesting light. Mainly in secret workings throughout the world, through its many agencies like the Knights of Columbus, uh, the Jesuits, um... Knights of Malta and these types of things. So, when I look at the Antichrist, I look at it as a system with which its seat being the papacy, not just one man pope, but I'm talking about the whole succession of that dynasty, which actually stems, which is connected to the Caesars in and of itself, because the papacy actually took the name of Pontifex Maximus from the Caesars and now have attributed that to themselves but that's another topic for another day I just want, I want to get into the study and and uh, add uh, a couple of other things in Daniel 11 which is very interesting as well so I'm just gonna go ahead and read this verbatim basically and it says the identity of the man of perdition is none other than Apollyon the beast identified in Revelation 13 now it's interesting that when you see the word term son of perdition in the King James Bible, it's only referenced twice. You see it referenced in Thessalonians, where the where the son of perdition will sit in the temple of God. We are the temple of God, declaring himself to be God. You know. And then the other time it uh was mentioned was in connection with Judas. Now who was Judas? Well, Obviously, he looked the part. He looked a part of the disciples. He played the part. But eventually, he betrayed Jesus Christ at the very end. And so, obviously, it's, just, you know, it's kind of a anti-typical reference of what the son of perdition in the future will do. Okay? So, the name Apollyon means a destroyer. Apollyon, the angel of the abyss. Um, transliteration, da da da. Short definition: destroyer, Apollyon, the destroying one. A Greek translation of the Hebrew Abaddon. Um, and uh, the cognate in six twenty three, uh, which also means cause to perish or be ruined. Properly, the destroyer from the abyss, i.e., Satan, used in only Revelation nine eleven. Now the term perdition which means ecclesiastical terms Christianity perdition also means destruction so what can you pick up here on this term here Christianity destruction this will seem to me that when I look at this in a spiritual sense that this is a counterfeit Christianity and obviously we know through the World Council of the Churches in Rome and these types of things that there is a counterfeit Christianity that has basically overtaken the world you need no look further than the church here in America under 501c3. Okay. 
It's a final and irrevocable spiritual ruin. The state as one that the wicked are said to be destined to endure forever. It's another word for hell in theology. It means utter disaster, ruin. From the Latin, it means ruin. From Latin, per dare, to lose. From per, away, dare, to give. So with this in mind, let's read Revelation 13.11. And they had as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, but in Greek he is the name Apollyon. This is the Antichrist, or a beast. Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet, Muhammad. Um, now, maybe that is, I, I don't believe the false prophet is one singular ind you know, individual, as is stated here, the spirit of Islam. Uh, before the term Islam I was coined, I think if you look at like the reformers of ancient past, of like the Reformation, uh, Islam was, was another term that was used, I think it was called Mohammedanism, and that is basically, you know, false prophet, you know, regardless, of, you know, the thing is with, with the false prophet is, um, the thing I see with the false prophet is, I think it's, 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 uh, representative part and partial of Islam, but the compromise between Christianity and Islam in and of itself, Chrislam, okay, where you have, you know, the church that believes that, you know, we're all praying to the same God and these types of things, that to me, in conjunction, would basically represent a fault, you know, the false prophet, okay, <sighs> who works signs in his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image, these two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. Revelation 17.11 says, The beast that was and is not is himself also the eighth and is of the seven and is going to perdition. Apollyon, Antichrist, man of perdition. <sighs> you know, words are very important in the Bible. You connect the dots with the words and you kind of see where they line up. And verse 13, it says, These are of one mind in Revelation 17, and they will give their power and authority to the beast, these will make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those who are with him are called chosen and faithful. 1 John 4, 2 states, By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God, and every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming, and is now already in the world. The Antichrist has three spirits with the same mind working through Apollyon, who works through the minds of the political leaders and the whole world, all who reject Christ. Revelation 13, 12 says, Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath, because he knows that he has a short time. Revelation 16.13 says, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Now the dragon and the beast are very interesting, because guess what? The dragon gives the beast its authority. Okay? Something to pay attention to. The dragon is Satan, the beast is Apollyon who is the Antichrist, and the false prophet is Mohammedanism or Islam, which is the false religion. Or let's also kind of put in there Chrislam. Okay. How can I say the Antichrist is not one man? And I, I, I there there's no conjecture here. I mean it's I that's I don't think there's any refuting this. For they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty, Armageddon. Now, in my personal opinion, when I look at this battle of Armageddon, I don't exactly see this as happening in one little piece of land called Megiddo. I think this is going to be a worldwide uh, conflict. Because the the end goal for Satan is to take as many with him as possible by diluting the mind strong delusion okay in order to take with him which God says fear not those who can kill the body but fear him which is God who can kill both body and soul in hell 
And so, really, the Battle of Armageddon is really going to be a worldwide battle, and it's going to be for your soul. Okay, we need not fear death in, in regards to the death of the flesh. All right, for those who are in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> for we do not fight against flesh and blood, Ephesians 6.12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. So with the above evidence, I would conclude that the dispensation of a human man Antichrist has no ground. In fact, if we read the, scriptural, the scriptures plainly, we find that the Antichrist actually works through all of the world leaders and people of the world. The New World Order is the system. There can never be one man to rule the world, not with the egos of the world powers of world leaders. Instead, it is a system of a collective whole in unison with the three unclean spirits spoken of in Revelation 16. It's the whole world under demonic possession, basically. However, the end-time saints will not be affected by the demonic influences. Those who are, those who fall away, the great falling away, and those who reject the truth of Christ will receive the mark of the beast, which is a human number. 666, 6 is the number of a man created on the sixth day. We are a triune species. We are body, soul, and spirit. All those who accept the way of the world, new world order, however, they bring it about, be it the chip, RFID, or some other mark, will go into perdition. We have not seen that on the world stage as of yet. My theory is it will be some medical device such as an RFID chip with medical history stored in DHS database, but that's just my idea. However, the Mark of the Beast is a representation of the New World Order. It says friendship with the world is enmity with God. There will come a time that NWO will push this chip or Mark agenda under the guise of unity with world peace and a holistic people. With ISIS coming out of Syria and the recent outbreak of Ebola, it is clear that Apollyon is now loosed on the earth. I speculate that the Antichrist has been in operation right under our noses while the majority of Christians still follow dispensational doctrines and interpretations and philosophies of men. Although subjective, I believe this is a strong thesis in a different yet biblical light of the identity of the Antichrist. This is a very interesting study. Uh, and... Um, I want to follow it up with another passage of scripture, okay, regarding Daniel 11. Now, Daniel 11 is a stream through history, okay, and it continues throughout today. Whereas you see the aspect of physical kings, the king of the north, king of the south, and you can kind of see the transformation from a physical sphere to a mindset sphere, okay. Because obviously the battle, the war is, you know, what is the greatest war? Was it World War One, Two, Nine Eleven, Communism, or is the war actually about you, the individual, and the mind, mindset, the heart, and these types of things? And the King of the North and the King of the South, basically, this the spirit of the King of the North and King of the South is what is at work today. And it's very interesting when you look at history, and you look at this map here, you know, this was the uh, four divisions of Greece that remained were those ruled by Cassander, Lysimachus, Seleucus, and the Ptolemy. And the king of the north in the first parts of this passage in Daniel 11 is talking about uh, the Seleucus Empire and Ptolemy. And Ptolemy was ruled over there in Egypt. That represented the king of the south. And this represented the king of the north. In Daniel 8, you see um, this little horn, which I believe is the Antiochus Epiphanes IV, which defiled the temple, and these types of things. This kind of had a spiritual, a religious mindset the king of the north did. Whereas the king of the south had more of a secular, humanism, humanistic mindset. You know, the, the Bill of Rights and these types of things. You know, basically erasing all the religious fervor. You know, get rid of the religions, all religions are equal and these types of things. You know, worship God according to the dictates of your conscience and, you know, and these types of things. This This was basically the... Spiritual mindset of the king of the south, which in turn was part and partial Egypt. So you have Egypt, which was which is a representative of maybe a secularistic mindset, be it atheism, humanism, 
communism, you know, these types of things. And the king of the north, which, you know, when you look up all throughout the huge empires in the past, Babylon, which was a religious, religio-political system, you know, now transformed in the mindset of men to choose side. Either you, you follow in lockstep with the king of the north, because the king of the south is now following at the king of the north step to this day right now. And I'll kind of bring that to light here in a moment. Or you're on the side of righteousness. And if you're on the side of righteousness, you are a separatist. You are separate from the ways of the world. Therefore, you are an enemy of this world. So in ancient times, uh, the Seleucus Empire is basically representative of the king of the north. And the Ptolemy Empire is representative of the king of the south. You know, it's just, that's just the basic, you know, without all of the hazy interpretations of Daniel 11, there's plenty of them. But this is just a basic overview. And from Daniel 11, verse 1 to 20, you get that overview. But... Starting in verse 21, you kind of start to get a religious type flavor added into this, okay? And so I'm going to read from verse 21 onward. Okay. And in his estate shall stand up a vile person, to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. And with the arms of a flood shall they overflow, shall they be overflown from before him and shall be broken. Yea, also the prince of the covenant. And after the league made, or a confederacy, or, you know, with him, he shall work deceitfully. For he shall come up and shall become strong with a small people. <clears throat> if you look at history, like with the Vatican, when the, the papacy lost its political status in 1798 through Napoleon, basically giving rise to a secular sphere to basically overflow the to, to uh, basically whitewash and get rid of the whole religio-political control and secularism took its place through revolutions and, uh, you know, 1776, you know, the liberty, you know, all of this stuff with a secular mindset, this kind of was part and partial of that. And then in 1928, Mussolini basically gave... Um, restored the papacy to a religio-political state in Rome, okay? And hence there we have, he shall enter peaceably even upon the fattest places of the province, and he shall do that which his fathers have not done, nor his father's fathers. He shall scatter among them the prey and spoil and riches, yea, and he shall forecast his devices against the strongholds even for a time. And he shall stir up his power and his courage against the king of the south with a great army. And the king of the south shall be stirred up to battle with a very great and mighty army, but he shall not stand, for they shall forecast devices against him. Yea, they that feed of the portion of his meat shall destroy him, and his army shall overflow, and many shall fall down slain. And both now pay attention here. So here we have this conflict between the king of the north and king of the south, but then something very interesting pops up here. In regarding to Hegelian dialectic. Alright. In verse 27 it says. And both these kings. The king of the south and the king of the north. Heart shall be to do mischief. So even your freedom fighters. And you know. Your, your, your liberty fighters. And these types of things. Even though you know on the open. It seems like they're doing right. But at the same time. They are kind of following the king of the north at his heels, at his step. Okay. And it says, And both these kings' hearts shall be to do mischief, and they shall speak lies at one table, but it shall not prosper. For yet the end shall be at the time appointed. <sighs> then, shall he re then shall he return into his land with great riches, and his heart shall be against the holy covenant, and he shall do exploits and return to his own land. What covenant is that? I believe that is the new covenant that we are under. At the time appointed, he shall return and come toward the south, but it shall not be as the former or as the latter. 
For the ships of Shittim shall come against him, therefore he shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the Holy Covenant. So shall he do, he shall even, ret even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. An arm shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, that they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. And they that understand among the people shall instruct many, yet they shall fall by the sword and by flame, by captivity and by spoil many days. So here we have this, this religious mindset coming into view. And here we have this spiritual battle coming into view and these types of things. Okay, and again, like I said, as I you know in the beginning when I just when I started going over Daniel eleven, at least the half you know last half of it, this chapter is a, is really a fantastic chapter because it really goes in from the time of history all the way up until present time and into the future. Okay. Now when they shall fall, they shall be hoping with a little help. But many shall cleave to them with flatteries, and some of them, understanding, shall fall to try them and to purge and to make them white, even to the time of the end, because it is yet for a time appointed. And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the indig indignation be accomplished. So this king is going to be ruling and is ruling until the very end of time. Till the very end. We repeat that. This king is ruling and will rule until the second coming. What do I mean? What do I mean by that? Well, this king is ruling right now. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women. Nor regard any god, for he shall magnify himself above all. But in his estate shall he honor the god of forces, and the god whom his fathers knew not, whom his fathers knew not, shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. Thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange god, whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory, and he shall cause them to rule over many, and shall divide the land for gain. And it, it is kind of. You know, when you look at history, you know, the division of Europe and all the European nations came in accordance to the papacy through the Dark Ages. They basically divided the land, you know, in different countries and stuff like that. Basically, what you see now is what happened during the Dark Ages. When you, you know, when you look at the globe today and you see all these little countries like, you know, Denmark and all these kind of things, that's basically how that transpired. Now, and at the time of the end, shall the king of the south push at him? So he kind of, kind of seems like he has a little bit of a victory there, and you can trace that back to the French Revolution under Napoleon. Had a huge impact on that, and obviously, it's kind of weird how Napoleon conquered Egypt. And when you look at this, isn't that interesting? Napoleon conquered Egypt, so thus he was he ruled over Egypt, and so did the Greek Empire as the king of the south. And this king of the south pushed at the king of the north. And what happened in 1798? All political power that resided with the papacy was destroyed. Something to think about. <clears throat> and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships and he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over he shall he shall enter also into the glorious land and many countries shall be overthrown by these shall escape out of his hand even edom and moab and the chief of the children of ammon he shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. 
but he shall have power over the treasures of gold and of silver and over all the precious things of Egypt and Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his step. So here is this secular mindset actually is now starting to follow in be at the king of the north step trying to you know they're going to be basically coming together while in the open it seems like they're in direct conflict but secretly they're all working for a common cause because i like i said when you look at egypt and these types of things, Egypt mainly is representative of a secular mindset. You go back in the time of Exodus, who is the Lord? I do not know the Lord. I will not. I will not let my people go. You know, the mindset of the of of Egypt was work, work, work for a better cause, and these types of things. Work, work, work. Away with the religious fervor. Secularism takes its cloak course. Humanism takes its course, but at the same time, humanism, secularism, atheism, and all this kind of stuff actually is working together with the king of the north. Because both these kings speak lies at one table. <clears throat> but tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Hmm. Uh, when you look at the, the second coming of Christ, doesn't he come out of the east? Isn't the true, true king of the north, isn't that representative of Jesus Christ? Those that preach on his coming, about his coming, isn't that those that trouble him, the, the false king of the north? Therefore he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to make away many. There's persecution coming. Now, this is the interesting part. And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas. And the, in the glorious holy mountain, yet he shall come to his end, and none shall help him. Now, a lot of people like to make this seem like a like the physical nation of Israel. You know, the Lord will, will roar out of Zion. The Lord will roar out of Jerusalem. But which Jerusalem is he going to roar out of? Is it the physical Jerusalem here on this earth, or is it the heavenly Jerusalem that's above? Now, when you look at in the glorious holy mountain, which which glorious holy mountain is this? Is this the holy Mount Zion that's in heaven, which is the kingdom of heaven, which we as believers strive to enter in? For we have no continuing city here on this earth. And so what is this king of the north doing? He's planting his tabernacles or churches in the glorious holy mountain. He is sitting in the temple of God, declaring himself to be God. Therefore, people that are believing in a lie, God is sending a strong delusion. Because they have not the love of the truth. They are believing in false prophecies. They are believing in false doctrines. That has crept in. You see the mindset at work here? Now let's take a look at secularism and the mindset, the spiritual mindset of the king of the south. What's going on? Remember I said that the Egypt and Libyans and Ethiopians shall be at his step? Let's go ahead and take a look at this real quick. Remember this? This is just a small example. Pope Francis assures atheists you don't have to believe in God to go to heaven. And the atheists are following right along lockstep with it. Because it's, it feels good to them. In comments likely to enhance his progressive reputation, this was from September 11, 2013, Pope Francis has written a long open letter to the founder of La Repubblica newspaper, Eugene Scalfari, stating that non-believers will be forgiven by God if they follow their consciences. Consciences. Okay. So, responding to a list of questions published in the paper by Mr. Scalfari, who is not a Roman Catholic, Francis wrote, You ask me if the God of the Christians forgives those who don't believe and who don't seek the faith. I start by saying, and this is the fundamental thing, that God's mercy has no limits if you go to him with a sincere and contrite heart. The, sh the issue for those who do not believe in God is to obey their conscience. You don't have to believe in Jesus Christ. You don't have to believe in, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Sin, he goes on to say, even for those who have no faith, exists when people disobey their conscience. So atheists, all you have to do is obey your conscience. And you're good. 
you don't have to believe in the cross. You don't have to. You don't have to believe any of that. And so, obviously, the secular mindset is, in a sense, following at the King of the North's step. And again, both these kings speak lies at one table. Even in the patriotic truth movement, folks, you have an open but false policy. These people are, are, are saying a lot of great things, but in a sense, can you really trust them? So, I hope this has been an interesting video. I know I went way fast because I'm kind of a little short on time, but um, I thought this was very interesting to kind of uh, put this together along with this little study here that was done. And I hope it has been very informative to you. And until next time, truth be told, truth be known, stay safe. God bless. We will see you next time. Bye-bye.